James is a photographer and videographer, and he's, since 1993 he's been collecting interviews um, of the movers and shakers in, in, in our movement, and most of them are posted on YouTube, and you will have seen some of them on YouTube, but James is going to give you um, a talk about his work and the sort of people he interviews and why. So, over to you, James. Thank you very much, David, and thank you everybody for being here. This is more than an honor. This is like a um, part, part of my whole intactivist journey, has, adventure, has been filled with wonderful people, wonderful events, and it's deeply moving to me to be here with you today because um, of everything that has led up to this, and it's not always been easy. There's been, for me, a lot of trauma involved, and overcoming that, and um, difficulties with, as you all know, with this issue with other people. So um, this, like all of my work, is a work in progress, and I call the presentation today Through an Intactivist Lens, which is how I have increasingly been seeing the world. Um, this is, uh, from a personal perspective, uh, at a very young age, I was artistically inclined, and I was always attempting to draw with realism as a very small child, and I was told that I was quite good. And I was always attempting to draw people in a realistic manner. Um, as a child, I experienced horrible night terrors, which I could n barely describe to my parents. But upon awakening, and it felt like I was still dreaming while I was awake, these horrific images of three and four leaf clovers would be coming down upon me, coming down upon me. And I would try to explain this to my parents. It's not, it's not, it's not a dream. It's real. It's real. And I didn't know what it was, and I was trying to draw them. I would draw these three and four leaf clovers. When I was seven years old, I was playing with another boy. And in a very um, innocent game, we exposed ourselves to each other, and I looked at his penis and wondered, ooh, what happened to him, thinking that the head of his penis had been cut off. And he very gently leaned over and said, oh, no, it's not me, but you had part of your penis cut off. And then he pulled back his foreskin, and in that moment I saw that what he said was true, and the recognition of that went through me like a shock. Later, I thought about this. You know, many times through my life I've thought about this, and I, I believe that that shock that I felt was a body recognition of the event and how profoundly circumcision had traumatized me. Um, this has disappeared. Um, when I was 10 years old, my family moved from Winnipeg, where I was born, to Vancouver, and on the way to Vancouver, uh, I purchased a camera for a dollar sixty-nine. It's exactly like that camera you have in that box at the norm office, actually, David. Um, and I started taking pictures, and with that, I found my medium because here I was able to achieve the realism that I was wanting. And I think that psychologically, it was a way of me, a very shy and indrawn, withdrawn child, to connect with other people because I was always attracted to depicting other other people. Uh, when I was 14, I saw a friend's Super 8 movie camera with a zoom lens, and I knew instantly I wanted one of those. I wanted to make movies. And the first movie I made was done at Stanley Park in Vancouver, and it was strictly trying to get images of all different kinds of people. So again, my, my focus was always on people. Uh, as I became sexually aware as an adolescent, I, I was very much a bookworm, and I was always reading, so I was gravitating towards books on sexuality. And in my um, adolescent research, I found uh, some very interesting uh, discussions about gender identity, and eventually it led me to uh, some of the works of John Money, and his book, um, which I read a little later, uh, Sex Errors of the Body, where for the first time I saw pictures of... Uh, intact intersex adults' genitals. And seeing this, which was really uh, one particular picture of someone who's really halfway between male and female, uh, this did something for me as far as um, an appreciation of the fact that male and female are not so different, that there's this spectrum. 
and uh, I've always been very attracted to and interested in the people who express themselves somewhere between the genders, you know, or, or what we socially think of as male and female. I've always been very interested in the intersex and the transsexual people. As I became uh, uh, sexually aware, I also was talking with my partners about circumcision. And I would often ask them, how do you feel about this? And I really noticed a pattern. I, I came of age in the 1970s, so this was a very, uh, you know, sexual liberation, and there was a lot of uh, freedom of, of sexuality, at least where I lived, and I think probably here too, you know. But I found that there was a real commonality uh, in the responses that I was getting on my question about circumcision, and that if the men that I was with were circumcised, their responses were often, oh, well, at least it was done when we were babies and we couldn't feel anything, and you know, we're better, it's cleaner, we should, you know, what, you don't like it? Well, that's weird. And if the person I was with was intact, they would usually be quite guarded with their feelings, and they would often say to me, well, what do you think about it? And when I expressed the feeling that, well, I don't think it's good, or I'm, you know, really, I don't like it, I'm angry about it, then they would be more forthcoming with their feelings and say, well, I agree with you, and I'm very sorry for that. I feel sorry for you. In my <clears throat> early readings um, on sexuality and gender, uh, I, John Money was kind of a superstar in those days, and there was a, um, an article about him in We Magazine, which was one of the men's magazines of the early, mid-70s. And uh, between that and uh, one of his books, Man, Woman, Boy, Girl, I read about this circumcision accident, which we later learned was David Reimer, who just so happened was born in the same city that I was, Winnipeg. And I remember being very concerned because the way this story had been told was that this child, who was being raised as a girl after this horrific accident, had no clue about her origins. And my sense was, when do you tell this child and what is the reaction of this person? So. My awareness of um, John Joan or patient X or whatever, however this person was referred to, was always with me. Um, as, a, as a young man, I also uh, traveled to various American cities, and I went to San Francisco for the first time in 1972, and then back again in 75, and saw for the first time a gay pride march, which in those days, was much smaller than it is today, but in San Francisco it was enormous. And in 1975 there was a live elephant with a drag queen on the back. There were <laughs> contingents of all kinds of people, and it was much more anarchy than it is today. There was no corporate uh, participation. It was really, uh, I, I don't want to say a freak show in a bad way, a freak show in a good way. But I remember after watching a couple of these parades over the course of the 70s, I was wondering, why isn't there some representation about circumcision? Why isn't anybody protesting that? Isn't that what this is all about? Uh, sexual liberation? And I was also wondering why there were no intersex or hermaphrodite people involved. There was virtually nothing like that. Um, so those questions certainly went through, through my mind. And as a photographer, I was shooting all of this stuff. And some of this is now some archival uh, value because you know there were fewer photographers in those days. So, like, for example, my uh, pictures of the 1975 parade are uh, some of the only ones. There are a handful of other photographers that were around in those days doing that. I have a little trouble with this thing. Just to scroll. And you can't blame Microsoft, John, it's Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to uh, sort of jump forward a bit. That was uh, the 70s, and it moved into the 80s, and a whole different kind of uh, political thing. And um, I, I didn't do too well in the 80s. I, I didn't like the political times, the Reagan Bush. Thatcher years were all very difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> but um, in, in 1993, I had what I would call my intactivist awakening. 
And I had gone to a bookstore in Vancouver, which is well known in my neighborhood. It's a little gay and lesbian bookstore called Little Sisters, which has had uh, an ongoing battle with Canada Customs about bringing uh, various books into, into Canada. And I had gone around the bookstore looking for a particular article in the newspaper, and I finally found it and was at the cash register to pay for it, and there was nobody here to wait on me, so I just thought, I'll just look at this for a minute until they see me. I'd already looked at everything else in the store, and I felt a tap on my shoulder, or one shoulder. And I have a friend who always plays this trick. I turned around, there was nobody there. And I thought, here's my friend who always plays this trick on me when we're out somewhere. He'll... And I sort of flipped around the other way, nobody there. But as I flipped, I caught sight of a book in the, sort of the farthest corner of the bookstore. I'm not sure how I saw the title, but it was very intriguing to me. And I went over and picked it up, and this was Jim Bigelow's book, The Joy of Uncircumcising. <laughs> Now, I'd heard about uncircumcising previously in the 1970s in the back of a gay magazine. And they sort of overviewed what was involved. You tug on your skin. I kind of tugged on the skin that I had. I thought, mm, that, that can't work for me. I'm too tightly cut. This isn't going to work. And I just thought, it's, it's, a, it's hokey. But when I saw Jim Bigelow's book, I thought, this is incredible because all of these people have credit. You know, they're... They're scholarly people, and it's uh, the, the sidebars were just amazing with all of these voices raised against circumcision. And it was the first time I'd heard anywhere uh, uh, the voices gathered, other than once in a while hearing somebody say, oh yeah, it's bad. So I went home and I read this book backwards and forwards for several days, and I started the process of taping. And I also wrote to the people that were listed in the back of the book, including uh, No Harm, No Cirque, and in those days, recap. And instantly I got uh, responses back from Tim Hammond and Wayne Griffiths and then Marilyn Milos. And I started to think about what is, it, what is it that I can do to help this cause. And I thought, well, the only thing I know how to do really is photography. And there are many places where I've stepped in before where I've been sort of the only photographer. And it's turned out like the gay pride marches, something that's of historical importance. So I thought, well, I'll, do, I'll somehow photograph this, whatever this is. And I knew I was going to uh, uh, document my own restoration because I thought the pictures in Jim's book could be added to. There should be many pictures of many men doing this. And then I heard that uh, Tim Hammond, who had formed No Harm, was organizing a protest for uh, children's rights in front of the uh, California Medical Association in San Francisco. And this was happening maybe a month or two after I bought this book, so I planned a trip to San Francisco, and I drove down with my camera and photographed this event. And it was a wonderful event with uh, uh, maybe 15 or 20 people, and you know, some were, there were some midwives there, there were nurses, and uh, I met Marilyn and Tim and Jim and uh, Wayne Griffiths. And they all welcomed me very warmly. It was a wonderful feeling of, of acceptance in this group. And uh, at the event, there was also a person I admire most highly is Hattie Lightfoot Klein, the author of a book on uh, female genital mutilation. And she had a woman friend of hers from Somalia who was a, a survivor of FGM. And uh, I, I quickly fell in with this group. And, and uh, anyway, so I, I documented this event. And at the end of it, Tim Hammond said to me, look up there. He pointed up in the window, and I couldn't really see anything. It was kind of a smoky glass window. And I said, who's that? He said, that's Edgar J. Schoen. <laughs> if you don't know who Edgar J. Schoen is in this group, I'm sure the person next to you can explain it. <laughs> now, back in Vancouver, uh, I saw a, an opinion piece written in the local paper uh, by Jacqueline Mayer. And she was writing a position as a nurse against circumcision. So I wrote to her. She had a group form called Ethic, End the Horror of Infant Circumcision. I wrote to Jacqueline and sent her some money so that she would send me their literature. And she quickly wrote back and then arranged a meeting. And she and I, her husband Pierre, met and talked about what we might do together in Vancouver. And one of the things that Jackie did is she lent me the audio tapes that Marilyn had made from, I think it's the second uh, No Cirque Symposium. 
And among those tapes were lectures by James DeMeo, uh, uh, Miriam Pollack, um, Michelle O'Daunt. I mean, just a whole roster of amazing people. And I spent the next few weeks listening to those tapes, and that was my formal intactivist education. And I heard stuff in there that was very, very powerful about how uh, Michelle O'Donnell talked about a woman's str uh, mammal's strongest urge being that of a mother to protect her baby. And James DeMeo talking about cultures past and present that all had rituals, over a hundred rituals documented, past and present, that all had one common denominator, and that was taking the baby away from the mother. So I quickly got a, a, a full, I, I felt a full education about what this was all about, a, a crash course in a way. And um, I then attended uh, one of the No Cirk Symposiums, I think the third one in uh, Maryland, in the eastern United States. I'm getting to the video part of this. Uh, I was photographing doing stills. And at that time, Marilyn was very supportive, and she said, you know, I think your idea, my idea was to put together a book of all the intactivists. A picture and then a description of what their perspective was, sort of to help carry their voices forward. And this is maybe thinking in the past, because in the past, these beautiful black and white photography books were very popular. They still are, somewhat. But it always bothered me, because I thought, I don't know that it's a still picture, and a little blurb is really going to adequately do what I would like to do. Then in the mid-90s, there was a spate of very good television shows about circumcision <clears throat> and about foreskin restoration. And I've been taping them and saving the tapes, thinking someday these tapes are going to be useful. Somebody's got to hold on to this. Um, and then, in 1996, I got a computer, and of course everything changed after that. And I was a little bit slow with the computer to begin with. I didn't really understand how it was going to work uh, for this issue and, and for my tactivism. But uh, it, it got me going and, and learning how to, how to di digitize things and, and work, work in the computer world. In, that, in 2005, YouTube appeared on the scene. And I think a few months after it had uh, made its appearance, I was already a, a member and under my named James 3D, I had a channel that I was now digitizing and putting all of these tapes that I had collected through the 90s of these various TV shows and segments from them. And any time that I happened to catch some celebrity on a talk show mentioning the subject, that went on there. And that was a very popular channel. It actually had one uh, segment from Tim Hammond's Whose Body, Whose Rights, with Hattie Lightfoot Klein talking about male and female orgasm after circumcision that had almost a million hits. And then I lost my channel. It was copyright infringement. Somebody reported me for something I posted and three strikes you're out with YouTube and I lost my James 3D channel. So I thought, I've got to do something original so that I can't infringe copyright. So based on what I had learned from Marilyn's tapes, and the people that I was in such, uh, holding in such high esteem who had uh, presented on, at the various symposia, I decided to start doing video interviews. And, uh, sorry guys, I'm just, uh, yeah. So, um, the, the, this was very natural progression for me because uh, shooting portraits is basically two things. You want to make someone comfortable, and you want to put them in a good light. And you guys are all in a beautiful light right now. <laughs> um, and, and then with video, it's, it's, really, it's really quite easy, because if you can interview someone, you, you ask them about what they're interested in. And people are funny. They're all the same way. Oh, I don't like my picture taken. But, oh, that's a nice one you took of me. <laughs> They'll say, uh, 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 you know, you say, well, uh, you know something about circumcision, would you talk to me? Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. And then the minute you sit them down, they don't stop. Because <laughs> not, not everybody listens, and everybody is happy when they hear somebody listen to the stuff that they know about. Is that is G. Schoen reticent to that talking about it? No, not at all. <laughs> Glad you asked about Mr. Schoen. Um, so, anyway... <coughs> 
I've been honing my skills. This is something that I'm self-taught as a photographer. I'm self-taught as a videographer. And uh, I love what I do, so it, it, in a sense it does come easily. And it's a pleasure working with the Antarctivist because everybody has a slightly different perspective on this. And very often I'll find that you know, somebody who has even said, well, I don't, what, what can I add to this? Other people already know more than I. But it's just their unique, that person's unique outlook or their experience is suddenly something that, wow, that's the real, that's the money shot, that's the gem of an idea here that I'm so glad we got that. So, um, sometimes it's really good. And I, I don't know how many people have seen these videos. I, I started several other YouTube channels, and I have now three or four or five, three main ones. And my main one, it was, until a few days ago, called Bonobo 3D, which was taking the place of James 3D. And on my Bonobo 3D channel, I've posted all original interviews and coverage of events, like um, demonstrations and things. Some of these videos are very, very simple, and others are very complicated. Some of them are very short, some of them are quite a bit longer. But every so often I'll get something that I think is particularly good. And uh, I think it was uh, two years ago in San Francisco, I interviewed a number of the attacktivists there, including a young man named Sean Michael Richard Rao. And Sean Michael was at the time 22 years old. He's an artist, very talented. And he told a story about trying to save his nephew from circumcision. And while he tells that story, he breaks down in tears. I have a hard time telling myself, and I'll, I'll view it from time to time, and just I'm amazed by his candidness and how much of himself and his experience that he did share. But what came from that was particularly good, because after the video was out, and I, I tell you, I so respect the people I interview because they're not only telling me their story, they're telling the world. And I get fantastic comments. I mean, people leave beautiful comments under these videos, but also get private messages from people that are very, very moving. And after <clears throat> Shawn Michael told his very tearful story, his mother, who had always been a little bit hesitant to talk with Shawn Michael about the circumcision that happened to him, saw his interview. And she said to Shawn Michael, where is the videographer? Tell him to come over and interview me. Mm -hmm. And so, my next trip to San Francisco will be with Sean Michael and his mom. I've also been very lucky with, um, you know, some of the intactivists that I really admired, like Leonard Glick. And um, on my interview with Leonard Glick, he talks about his book and his his work and everything that led to writing his book, Circumcision, or Marked in Your Flesh, Circumcision from Ancient Judea to Modern America. But he also makes a statement, which is the soundbite from that particular interview. And in that <coughs> interview, he says that the reason he's an intactivist is that he believes fundamentally cutting the genitals of boys or girls is fundamentally evil. Um, I also interviewed Van Lewis, who I think most people in this room will know was one of the early intactivists. Van Lewis and his brother Ben protested in 1970 in Tallahassee, Florida, in front of the hospital where they had been circumcised as babies. And they were arrested, and their protest signs were destroyed by the police and locked in jail. And Van comes from a very influential family, so this was all, you know, quite shocking behavior on the part of these young men. And I was very taken with Van when I met him because not only is he a very wonderful human being, but also a great storyteller. And so when Van and I sat down in 2010, he told his story to me on camera. And I got that on video and was able to post it. And I also knew at the time that Van was suffering with pancreatic cancer and had a very short time to live. So I felt very lucky to be able to get that while he was still well enough to share his story. And shortly after posting that, maybe a month or two later, he phoned me up and he said, James, I've got to tell you, that video has done more for me 
than I was able to do in my own life with my own family. All these years, I've been trying to explain to my family what this is about. And they saw the video and said, now we get it. So the videos have had unexpected consequences. Uh, I've got about 120 on this one channel. And they've gathered, I think, something like half a million views. Uh, the one with Marilyn Milos, somehow it was not the first one posted, but the views for this one have gone up and up and up. And, up. <laughs> and when I saw Marilyn in San Francisco, I guess it was a year ago, it was at 50,000, and it, it turned to 50,000 while we were sitting at the dinner table where I was watching, because I knew it was going to happen while I was there. <laughs> So I think we had a glass of wine for that. <laughs> and um, then it went from 50,000, suddenly the numbers went up, 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 and it, like, exponentially it got more and more and more. So now it's at, uh, I think, 180,000 a year later. So I'm very glad to see uh, people are recognizing that. And the comments reflect greatly, I think, the, the effect that it's having on people. Some people say they you know, went to school, they learned anatomy, they learned more in this short video than they ever did in their whole anatomy class about human genitalia. Um, just about, uh, here we go. Sort of this thing's One of the things, uh, some of it's a bit unexpected. Like, I received a, an email one day from somebody who had been transcribing the interviews verbatim and just wanted my permission to post these on, a, on a, another website, which is fantastic because, you know, now somebody who's hearing impaired could read them or they could be referred to more easily, you know, to be able to grab a section of dialogue from there. And uh, another uh, very unexpected thing happened when I got a phone call from a young filmmaker from Los Angeles. And he said he was making a film about circumcision and could he interview me and could I direct him to some other people for interviews as well and that he had gotten this idea from seeing the interviews on the Bonobo 3D channel. Well, I was quite cautious because, you know, we're cautious about telling everything to somebody we don't know. And he wanted to interview Marilyn, and Marilyn phoned me up and asked me, what do you know about this guy? And, well, the minute I met him, I knew that he was not only okay, but he was wonderful. Yeah. And his, um, his talent and his technique is exemplary. He's a very different person than myself. He's more formally taught. And he and I have become good friends. We talk often, almost every week about this. And he's going to be using some of the footage that I have that, of people that he couldn't get. So that, to me, is really what I had. It was beyond my hopes with this project of making videos. That it, it was my hope that it would inspire others. And so now, with that in mind, and with these little successes, is also uh, Facebook. And you know, in the almost 20 years that I've been doing this now, I've been able to sort of squint at the thing and see its progression. And I, I hear all the time from us, uh, you know, what a tough slog it is, how depressing it is, how little progress there is. And yet, when you look at this trajectory of where we were 20 years ago, and then where we were even before that, and one of my interviews is with a man named Jim Perrone, who was really one of the first intactivists, and his story is another tearjerker, I won't even begin. But uh, I see wonderful, wonderful progress, and there's been this boost of people lately. We've been getting through social media, through Facebook and Twitter, which I don't even know much about. And some of these people are coming really informed, because they've been reading the literature, they've been watching the videos, and other people are making videos too. And, you know, we talk with each other, we share techniques and ideas, and there's no end of ideas. You know, uh, when this whole thing started, you often hear people say, well, what, what can you talk about about a silly flat of skin? How much can you say about something like this? <laughs> well, it's like that list of names for the, for the organization. That's a small <coughs> list. You know, you can just keep going and keep going. There's always another angle to this. And this touches everybody. For myself, um, I, I there's another theme weaving through here about my own trauma, and that these nightmares that I experienced as a child, which I always thought were circumcision-related, but I just couldn't figure out that 
those clovers, those clovers, what's this thing coming down that's so oppressive? And a year ago, a year and a half ago, I was reading something online, it was from a UK, the UK Independent newspaper, and there was an interview there about a man who was doing foreskin restoration. And in the interview, he talked about night terrors. And he said that they were dreams that he couldn't wake up from, and that his parents would try and hold him, but he didn't want to be touched. That was exactly my feeling. And then he said the words, but it's real. That's what I said. But he didn't say, and there was one thing different. He had, in his dreams, there was cutting. I didn't have any of that. I didn't know about that. But there were no four-leaf or three-leaf clovers. So for 56 years, I've been puzzling and saying, no, it, the thing that's puzzling me is the clovers. And then suddenly I got it. I went to my computer, and I typed in surgical lamps, vintage surgical lamps. And sure enough, they're all in either three or four round clusters. And that, for me, was confirmation that what I had experienced was a very vivid recollection terror from what had originally happened. And now, I'm very keen. I interviewed uh, Dan Bollinger, who had also had nightmares as a child, and his continued right into his, his adulthood. So this, for me, is one aspect of this that I will always want to interview people about night terrors. I always want to interview Jewish intactivists. I always want to interview Muslim intactivists. I, I want to interview everybody, but there are certain aspects of this that I think are particularly important that these voices be heard and brought forward. <coughs> Uh, I have dabbled, I'm just about done here, I've dabbled a little bit with being on camera myself <laughs> when I did what I consider an open video letter to a circumciser, Helen Salisbury, who had been particularly blatant in an article talking about, I, I mean, it, it, it's beyond my comprehension, the things that she said in this article in public proudly. Uh, I can't remember, I didn't post the, the quotes here, but you can see the, the video on, on my channel. And I mean, it's, 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 it's like a, a serial killer bragging about their victims. So I made an open video letter to her, reading it to her, Dear Dr. Salisbury. I don't think I called her doctor, actually. I think I called her by her first name. And uh, this, this video has generated other... I, what I'm wanting to do is get other people to make open video letters, because I think that a lot of these people who are so blatantly in the media about circumcision need to be held accountable. In the old days, we would write a letter to the editor and hope that the editor would publish it, and very often they didn't, or they would make sure they had 50-50 for and against. Now we have control of this media, and we can all address our circumcisers, circumcisers in general, the dark side, however we want to do that. But I do have some projects for the future. I want to do more open letters. I want to go onto the street and um, talk to the average person. You know, we maybe have a, a box like this with a bunch of questions in it and ask them if they'd like to talk on camera and just answer a question. And they'll pick a question and guess what? It's about circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I used to have a pack of cards in which I feel the card, the card was a nine of hearts. <laughs> and the, the nines of hearts were shorter than the others, so you could always get someone to pick a nine of hearts. Yes, yeah. That's basically the same, the same card trick. But uh, there are lots and lots of ideas, and there's lots of young people coming to this with so much enthusiasm. And we just saw recently how this uh, Bob Block from the AAP had put his Face, his face and hands up on Twitter with AAP rocks. Well, within a day, a young intactivist from um, the Maritimes in, in Canada contacted me, very shy, very cautious. James, what do you think about this idea? And he said, how about us intactivists put AAP no ethics? Well, I said, Mark, his name is Mark McLeod. I said, Mark, that's a great idea. Well, he went to the whole network, and they set this up, and they posted on Facebook, and within a day, there were 500. Another day, there were 750. And these were creative pictures. There were whole groups of hands and families and little children and 
lots of people at this dentist. <laughs> and then, another day later, I think it was Lauren Jenks of the Whole Network put together this video with a very compelling soundtrack of some protest. Um, can't think of the, I don't know the group, but it's very strong. And that video got was doing very well. Every day it was getting hundreds of views, and it's got something like 7,000 now. And so I think a lot of the people who we're working against haven't a clue what they're up against. You know, they're, they're, this is not going away. We're not going away. We keep getting better ideas. We're, some of us are getting to be the older uh, ones that can encourage the younger. And so I think with that dynamic, we're going to just keep going. And that's basically my, my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, James.